Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for this morning where we can come together and worship you and in safety and peace, Lord. Uh, Heavenly Father, this morning, uh, uh, we continue to lift up this church before you as we uh, continue to look for uh, a VM pastor and a senior pastor. Father, we pray that you would just continue to uh, sustain us in our search and that you would just uh, grant us wisdom as we uh, as we seek and as we look, Lord. Father, we also lift up uh, uh, the, the members of our congregation who are sick or recovering or uh, Lord, in, in particular, we lift up uh, the family of, of, of Uncle David as they continue to uh, uh, just deal process uh, the loss of our, our dear brother, Lord. And we pray that you would uh, just strengthen their hearts and, and to uh, renew their hope, Lord. Father, we also lift up our sister Sydney as she prepares for operation tomorrow, Lord. We pray that you would just grant her strength and uh, that you would bless the doctors as well as they perform the operation. And, and lastly, Lord, we lift up uh, the ongoing wars overseas, Lord, both the Ukraine and Russia, and also uh, Israel and Hamas. Lord, we know that you do not take delight in the destruction of any peoples, and we pray that uh, that your will will be done, Lord, and that, that uh, peace would be restored, and that you would protect those who are uh, who could cry out to you. And Father, uh, we pray not only for the physical safety of those abroad, but even the the ideological clashes that are happening domestically as people uh, are just uh, clashing over who to support. Father, we pray that um, your spirit would just uh, move those uh, to uh, towards your will, Lord, and, and that we would not be taken captive by the, the ideas of, of the world or of the enemy. So we thank you, and we, uh, we lift up this time to you in praise and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Alright, let us rise for worship. Out of 
the silence, the rolling lion, declare the grave has no credit on me. Then can the morning, but seal the promise, you bury body, begin to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declare the great has no grand on me. Jesus, your is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. There's a law, His greed on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. There's a law, His greed on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you're my living hope. For what break your 
Everything I fall for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Exactly what's going on, Father? You are our hope, and we continue to look for you for for our deliverance. So we thank you, and we lift up this time to you once again. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Good morning, OC, and welcome to uh, October fifteenth. I think yeah, I can't remember. Anyhow, uh, on to our announcements. Uh, we had our congregational meeting last week, and so we're glad to just. Uh, to congratulate the, the newly confirmed elders and deacons for the next year. Uh, the, our, our staff has lifted us up here, and uh, we have a lot of returning uh, folks. But uh, So just uh, praise the Lord, and we can keep these uh, co-workers in your prayers as we move forward to the next year. Also, another announcement. Uh, for the leadership of next year, we have uh, elected our council chair, which will be Elder Jonathan Shen, and our vice chair will be Elder William Huang. Uh, I will be the Elder Board Secretary, and uh, Aaron will be the Elder Deacon Board Secretary. So pray, keep, <laughs> keep us in your prayer. Uh, also, more in prayer, uh, if you remember uh, Pastor Will's wife, Sydney, she will be going uh, surgery for breast cancer tomorrow. So please keep her in prayer for uh, a good procedure and uh, also a, a smooth recovery. And then uh, just a... Uh, Another reminder for from from last week that uh, there have been a number of of, of break-ins uh, in the EFC churches in the Southern California. So uh, just please uh, stay vigilant, stay cautious. If you see anything out of the ordinary, or if you're the last to leave, just uh, remember to lock up. So uh, we are take care of our our property. And then also Hallelujah Night is our uh, joint. Uh, Celebration with GBC coming up at the end of October. This is just a little under two weeks, so uh, remember that that's happening. And if you want to volunteer, uh, please contact uh, Justin, and he'll get you a uh, sign-up information so we can get that tracked. This morning, our scripture reading comes from the Book of Romans, chapter eight, verses twenty-eight, and it reads as such: "And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose." Now, I know last week we had indicated that this week's uh, speaker would be Pastor Ted, but something came up and he was not able to make it. But by God's grace, we have grace. So please join me in welcoming uh, Pastor Ewan Grace back to the stand as he uh, shares his message with us, the hardest truth to believe in the, in the Bible to believe. <laughs> Ted um, sends his apologies. I'm, I'm sorry that he couldn't be here, but he loves you guys so much you know that, and so he prays for you all the time. And, and uh, you know, because I visited you a couple times, I do that too. So last night, <laughs> I'm just doing great up here, aren't I? How, how am I doing? Like a typical boomer with technology. <laughs> Honey, can you show me how to turn on this computer? <laughs> and what's a text message? Oh, thank you. Now, Ted. Um, Ted has got everybody over there praying for y'all. And then I got my small group praying for you guys last night. I got, I got a small group in Irvine, and it's been a blessing. And Ted's a joy to work with. He, he and I have friends for a long time, as I always tell you. Um, they, recently, they recently promoted me over there, so I got a new office. Yay. 
the former senior pastor's uh, office, so it's a big, nice one. And um, I'm so blessed. Those guys take good care of me, and we, we love the journey, guys, but we love our sister churches and neighbor churches, so you got to know you got folks praying for you, too, you guys. And we always tell everybody over there how awesome you were. I, I told them last night at that um, small group that you guys are a wonderful bunch, and it's so good to be here. By the way, since we're a family, I would like you just to take a couple of minutes Maybe look at the person next to you. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're part of my family. Go ahead. Say it out loud. You may have to yell it because there's nobody by you. Now turn to your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, I'm glad you're part of my family. <laughs> That's awesome. It's good to be reminded of that. And I, I like that, man. I, I just like to have the family. It's, it's a forever family, isn't it? That's what it really is, and, and we've come into this wonderful situation where God has got our, our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and our, our just future is sealed in Him. Partly, the reason I like to do this is just to wake us up and get us moving around, but you know, a lot of times we speakers will start off with a little joke or something, you know, and that can sometimes be good, but it can sometimes go a little far, because this is worship after all, and we're worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but I know sometimes it helps a little. I, I remember in this regard, I, I recently heard one that kind of cracked me up. This, this, uh, the joke goes like this. Okay, so this woman dies. She's going to the pearly gates and she's about to go in. St. Peter says, uh, just a moment. Before you come in, we just have a little thing we do. Um, just spell a word. We just like to, you to do that. It's interesting to see what you pick. She goes, oh, any word? He goes, any word at all. So she goes, L-O-V-E. Oh, perfect. Come on in. Great. He says, you know, before you get comfortable in there, could you hold my desk for a minute? Because i got a couple of things I need to do. If you'll just hold the, hold the desk, and if anybody comes in, you see the drill now, you know what to do. She goes, sure. So she's at, at the desk, and all of a sudden, who do you think is the first person that comes through that door? It's her ex-husband. Yeah, you heard this joke. <laughs> but you're smart. You can predict. That's pretty good. She has the gift. <laughs> Listen to her if she speaks about the future. <laughs> so all of a sudden, here comes her ex-husband. And he's walking up toward the pearly gates. And she's sitting there going, I'm in charge. So she says, uh, hi. He goes, you? She goes, you? <laughs> anyway, she goes, well, you want to come in, of course. And he goes, yes. She goes, well, before you do, there's a, there's a thing they do here. And you've got to spell a word. So just, just spell a word. He goes, any word? She goes, no, you have to spell Czechoslovakia. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. If I was there, I'd go, but I'm not there. <laughs> so let's, let's get into something more serious today. The, the word today is, is one of those times where, where we do a simple, have you noticed sometimes we'll come in and we'll have a, like a big long chapter or even more uh, to share, which is great because you can't get too much of the word of God in you. You know that. But sometimes we like to come with just a, just a shorter, like one message. I, I remember when I was younger, I used to read Spurgeon, that great pastor from yesteryear. And he would sometimes take one little verse or a part of a verse and he would just share about that and exegete it and e expound on it. And boy, it would bore down in your heart and change your life. So today, this is one I'm hoping will. I know you've thought about this one a lot and, and you've heard it probably many, many times. But I want us to think about this. And I, I call this, whether this is really exactly true or not, but I like to think of it as the hardest truth in the Bible to believe. This is the hardest truth in the Bible to really, really get your head around and believe. And by the time I finish, let's see if you agree with that or not. You know, um, if you have a, a Bible or if you have a, you know, your device that you use, you're welcome to look at it. But I think you know this verse by memory. How many of you know this verse by memory? Do some of you? Right? It's, it's kind of pretty in, in different versions today and paraphrases, but, but it's a beautiful. I learned it in the one that you guys put it up there, which I, which I like. And let's, let's read that out loud together. You want to? Let's read it if you can see it well. So this is Romans 8, 28. Let's read. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. In Romans 8, 28. Lord, bless the reading of Your Word and the expounding upon it. We pray that human flesh won't get in the way of Your Spirit, that You'll speak to our hearts today. And you'll not only encourage us, but You'll charge us, Lord, with what You want us to do in these days that we're living in. God, You said to redeem the time because the days are evil, and we sure see that around us with lots of hatred being slung back and forth and trouble and wars and rumors of wars. But Lord, you put us here in this place in Southern California for a reason and for a time. So Lord, help us to bloom where we are planted 
and be faithful servants of yours. Today, I pray this message will reach our heart and then go even further out into our hands and feet and our, and our tongues that we can tell others about you, Lord, and, and we can love others for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, um, Alfred Adler is a guy that wrote um, some stuff, but one time he just told a story about when he was, he was in Austria in a train station, of all things. You know, it's, it's strange, but that, that's where he was, and he was just in one of these metro stations. And this guy came up to him, not uncommon, it's even more common for us nowadays, but a guy came up and said, I wonder if you would loan me some money so I could buy some wine. You know, there's something about that guy, the way he asked that, because most of them say, can, can I borrow some money to buy some food? Well, we're not judging them. We suspect that it's going to be liquid lunch, right? <laughs> but this guy was so upfront and just so candid. And he said, can you loan me some money so I can buy some wine? And so the man, he said, you know, I'll be glad to help you if I can. But, but first of all, I'd like you to tell me how you got in this situation. How'd you get here like this? The guy said, well, it's a long story, but, you know, I'll give you the nutshell version. He goes, um, you know, he said, I, I was born with a couple of, you know, a couple of family members there, brother and sister. And he said, I, my father was a, was a brutal man. And sometimes he would beat us pretty severely. And he said, uh, my mother died when I was pretty young. The world war came to our community and, and it scattered us. And it was so bad. We were so bombed out. It, it relates to today, doesn't it? Because we were so bombed out that it literally scattered our family. They came and gathered up some of us and, and took us all. We didn't know where we were going to the four winds. And he said, because of that, my father was, was brutal. My mother died. War came and scattered us. And my brothers and sisters, we haven't seen each other in years. He says, because of all these things, because of all these tragedies in my life, I become an alcoholic. There's my story. And the man said, you know, that's interesting. He said, virtually the same thing happened to me. He said, I, I grew up in a family that was about the size of yours. He said, I my father was brutal and he would beat us and, and abuse us, you know, with his fists and feet. And he said, my mother died when I was young. The war scattered us too. And I haven't seen my family for years either. They sat down to drink a cup of coffee and they discovered that they were brothers who'd been separated by the war. You know, isn't it strange? They, one man was quite successful. All the things that happened to him in his life all these things, that tragedies that came into his life, he became very successful. The other became an alcoholic. It's, it's the very same son that was beating down on both of them, but one of them turned out one way, one of them turned out the other. It's the strangest thing, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that there's kind of an old Greek saying, but it says the, the same son beats down upon the clay and the wax. The clay, it makes brittle and, and it breaks easily, but the wax, it makes soft and pliable. And you never know how it's going to work in your life. And I, I think it's, here's one man driven to drink because of his bad background, and another man driven to become tremendously successful because of his bad background. So today I want you to think about this, this little short verse that says, all things work together for good to them that love God. All things. Isn't it strange? And let's see if God will help us to flesh that out a little bit. You know, um, there's a few of us left that were English majors. I know there's none here. We're a rare breed. We're rarer than the buffalo, than a four-leaf clover. You know, I mean, when I was studying English at University of Texas at Austin, I, my friends who were engineering majors and computer science majors, more practical, realistic things, they, would, they were nice to me, but they'd kind of bust my chops a little, and they'd go, well, you, and so you're an English major. Well, that's, that's nice. They go, now, when you graduate, what are you going to do? Open a little English shop on the corner? You know, I went, mm -hmm. No. So, I mean, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just knew that was the only subject I ever liked in, in high school. And when I was in New York playing jazz in these old smoky clubs, you know, I just wanted to come back and get an education. I remember one, by the way, one night I was about two o'clock in the morning in one of these old jazz clubs when I was a jazz drummer for these years. I thought that's what I was going to do all my life. And it's like the Lord spoke to my heart. And, and I was sitting there was looking at all these people in those days, you could smoke in the bars and drink, and here's somebody with somebody else's wife and husband. I mean, it's, it's just some life, isn't it, you know? And I was this Christian, but I was kind of backslidden off into the world a little bit, into music. I wasn't doing all those things, but I just played music, and I guess I sort of worshipped jazz or whatever. I don't know. And it's a weird thing to worship, but I remember one time God spoke to my heart and said, in a still, small voice, kind of whispered into my soul, Ewan, is this what you were born for? 
Is this what you're put here for, to be a jazz drummer in a smoky club in New York City, you know, for the rest of your life and play these concerts and venues? It, it's fun and it's, it's wonderful, but God, God said, no, I got something more for you. So I went back to Texas. My dad's a prosecutor. My brothers and, you know, were, were lawyers and different, different professions. So they, they said, you're going to finish college. That's wonderful. And I said, sure I am. They go, well, what are you majoring in? I go, I don't know. And they said, well, was there ever anything you liked in high school? I go, no. <laughs> I liked recess. No, I'm kidding. And they said, well, was there any course you ever took that was good? And I remembered I had this woman, Molly Newsom, and she was a Christian woman. She was a kind Christian woman. We all knew she was a believer. It was a secular school, so you couldn't wear it on your shirt sleeve or Bible bang anyone. But she would always say, guys, you know what? In the Bible is the best literature. She goes, by the way, the Bible is a great book if you don't know. You know, she's always gently trying to bump us to Jesus. What a sweet lady. But because of her spirit and her kindness, it made me sort of like it. And so she's having us learn poems, you know, and stuff. Remember that? Had you had to learn poems? How many of you know at least one poem from high school? Nobody? How about a limerick? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I remember most of us know poems like Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood. Remember that by Robert Frost? Sorry I could not follow both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Remember that? There's so many poems. So I liked those and I did memorize them as best, as best I could. So I said to my brother, yeah, there was one course I liked and it was English. And he goes, congratulations, you're an English major. So, okay, so there I was. That's why I was majoring in English. Well, in my course of my studies, we came upon this book by Thomas Hardy called Tess. Have you ever heard of it? Tess of D'Urbervilles. It's a, it's a beautiful story about this small English village and this beautiful young woman. And this woman was a virtuous, good woman from an honorable family, but she gets married and she was naive. And this landowner that was nearby, this very handsome, rakish kind of fellow, he he saw Tess, how beautiful she was, and her husband was named Angel Claire. He had to be away sometimes on, on business, you know, purchasing sheep or whatever they were doing. And so this guy seduces Tess, and he causes Tess to fall and, and commit adultery, I'm sorry to say. And so when she came to and realized what had happened to her, she'd been a good, sweet, virtuous woman, and she got seduced into this and somehow allowed herself to fall into it, she killed her, her lover, the seducer, she murdered him. She came to and she was in sort of a state. It's kind of horrible, but that's Thomas Hardy. And, you know, they tried her. The judge found her guilty and he sentenced her to death. She was to be hanged by the neck until dead. So th the story advances further and it shows that there's Angel Claire, her husband. He's out there outside of the jail and he's standing next to Tessa's sister. And the order said at 8 o'clock, there'll be a black flag that comes up. And when it does, you'll know that that's when she's hanged. You can't watch it. They didn't do that then, but that's how they did it. So Angel Claire's standing out there with Tessa's sister and feeling horrible. 8 o'clock on the dot, the flag comes up. It stays there for a few minutes, and then it comes down. And Angel Claire looks at Tessa's sister, and he said, The president of the universe has finished his work. He is done with his sport, with our Tess. Isn't that bleak? That's dark, isn't it? I mean, that's one view of life. That's one view of life, a fatalistic view that fate is all we have and that, that you know, if God, if there is one, they, they say, he, he doesn't really care about us. He, he has sport with us and plays with us like little toys. And when he's done with us, he casts us off into the slag heap of humanity. That's one view of life. It's fatalistic. And you know something? That's what many of us go, go through life and have and don't know about. There's the technology. I'm destroying it. And you are a good man. God bless you. You don't have to pay tithe today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What's your name? My name is Ian. God bless Ian. By the way, Ian, I like that name. My name's Ewan, but when I go over to Britain, they always call me Ian. Oh. So I'd rather have your name. <laughs> if you want to trade, see me after and we'll talk about it. You may have to throw in a little something, but we'll... No, Ian, seriously, thank you, brother. So, so um, you know, Paul, he is, he is relating to us that there's a view of God that is not the fatalistic view. There's a view that that's the fatalistic view, fate, but we're talking about faith here. And Paul is pushing us like he's pushing the church at Rome and all the churches that he planted to know the Lord, to have faith in him and look at life very, very differently from that. That's not the way it is. So Paul says, we know 
that all things work together for good. Did you notice that? That's, that's one of those things in the Bible that's so simple. We could miss that little opening phrase of this verse. And we know that all things work together for good. But trust me, the Apostle Paul, who was a very schooled and learned Pharisee before he became a Christian, studied with Rabban Gamaliel the elder, the best rabbi that anyone knew back there. He is such a virtuous and intelligent and wise rabbi that he wound up telling them when they were going to persecute the Christians, he said, be, be kind of careful because if this is just another cult, it'll fade away. But if this is of God, we're going to be finding ourselves fighting against God Almighty himself. That's Rabban Gamaliel the elder that, that taught Paul. So Paul he chose his words carefully when he has a terse little, little a charge like this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. He uses those words advises, advisedly. And that's how the British say it. I use the term advisedly and it means with due consideration. He seriously looked at those words. So, and we know, well, you know us seminary grads, we like to, we like to parse the Greek, Greek words and stuff. How many of you switch off as soon as you hear us pastors say, now the Greek says, you go, don't care what the Greeks... How many of you really get fired up when we say... Now, in the Greek, it says, nobody. Okay, so you're blessed if you fall asleep at that point. Only at that point, though. So, but I want to take today to do that just for a moment, if you don't mind. Because the word is important. He says, and we know. That word is gnosko in Greek. It's not oida. Oida means we know by formulaic, you know, by materialistic exam and, and checking it out kind of way. Um, according to formulas and devices, experience like gravity, etc. But, but this gnosko is a beautiful kind of know. It means to know with experience of your life, to know it deep in the center of your being, to know in a deeper way than just knowing something. I know that it's sun up. I know it's time for lunch or I know it's this or that. Gnosko is a deep, beautiful thing. And he said, and we know it's a belief born out of life. It's born out of our personal experiences, sometimes born out of our hurts and out of our struggles. We know by personal experience that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So here's the two views of life, the fatalistic view and the faith view. But I want you to think about this. There's not a promise in the Bible that's better than that. There's not anything that's more reassuring than that. There's not a verse in the Bible that's sweeter than that. If you think about that, on our gloomiest day, at the worst point of our depression, when we feel the most alone, when we feel the most oppressed, when we feel the most abandoned, we can say all things are working together in a pattern of good to those that love God. I know that, like Paul said, I know by the power of God, by the truth of the gospel and the experiences of my life, that God is working all things together for good to those who love Him. See, these were favorite words of Paul. You know that, right? I know some of you are familiar with this beautiful phrase in, in that, that he said. He said, I know whom I have believed. It's the same word, gnosko. Remember that? I love that. I think we've all said this at one time in our life if we've walked very long down the Christian path. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that that I've committed unto him against that day. We know and sometimes it's, it's deeper than just knowing with your head. You know, this philosopher Pascal, if you've ever heard of him and read about him very much, there's a one phrase that really, really, really resonates from Pascal that people remember him by, if nothing else. And he said this beautiful phrase. He was talking about in the context of romantic love. But he said, the heart has reasons that reason knows not of. And I love that. The heart has reasons that the mind knows not of. And that's the kind of no that Paul's talking about here. I'm belaboring this point because it's so very important for us to realize. Paul said, we know this. You can take this to the bank. You can make a book on it. <laughs> this is for sure absolutely true. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. By the way, I want to say this. We don't go very far in our life before we're hitting something that really, really makes us crazy. We just don't understand. If this is the kind of world this is, I feel horrible. How many of you have ever been really disillusioned before? Have you been where you expected something to be great and you, you knew it was going to be just what you dreamed of? And it's so disappointing, disillusioning. You know, we all run into that sooner or later. 
And how many of you have been through something so hideous? You've been walking your, your faith out. You've been reading the Bible and praying. You've been trying to do right and stay away from evil. And if you did stumble, you quickly confess like the Bible says to do and, and let God wash you clean with the blood of His, His death and burial and resurrection. Yet, everything seems to go wrong. Have you had those days before? Everybody does. And what do we usually do at that time? Well, we cry out to God, and after a while we ask for His help, and we get tired, and it seems like the help never comes. And finally, we feel abandoned, and we just think, what kind of world is this? I, I don't know. You know. I just am sick of this. What on earth is going on? And we say, why, God? Why me? You know, we've all gone through that at one time or another. But I want you to always have this resonating in your head. We know, no matter what, I might parenthetically add, that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now there's something I'd like to do right quick, and that is just touch on what the verse does not say. So such a small verse can be misinterpreted, and many people do that. Have you ever met somebody that'll say, well, you know, the Bible says pretty clearly that a penny saved is a penny earned. Have you ever heard people say that? <laughs> they got the Bible mixed up with poor Richard's almanac, you know, or something. I mean, people need to know the Word and get into it. It doesn't mean you have to be a, a biblical scholar all the time. But what does the Bible say? What does it not say? Well, some people misinterpret this verse. They say, well, the Bible says that everything works out for the best. Does this verse say that? Did you read it that way? It, it, some people think that, that everything works out for the best. You know, I hate to say this. This is going to sound like a little bit of fire and brimstone, fundamentalist preacher down in the South talking about the flames of the bad place. But just gently, I want to touch on this. This is saying all things work together for good. To whom? To them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. I hate to say it, but if you're not a Christian, everything isn't working out for the good. Everything's working out to your total damnation. In our day and age, we hate to say that, and some of the world doesn't want to follow Christianity because they think we Christians are a bunch of haters and we're exclusive and we, we don't love other people. I go around to campuses and speak at UCLA and, and, and USC and Harvard and other, other places, and when I do, there's always people that will come up afterward and say, I'm a Buddhist, what do you say to me? I, I'm, I'm a, a Hindu, what do, you, what do you think about me? And I always tell them the same thing. Well, you're, you're going to die and fry while I go to the sweet by and by. No, I don't say that. You know I don't say that. I always tell them, I'm kidding, see if you're awake. No, I always say to them, you know, I respect every person's religion. I do respect it. And I know sometimes wherever you're born determines that. I'm just here to tell you, but I have found a, a person, it's not a religion, it's a relationship with, with the one who claims to be God and nobody's been able to refute it. And he, and he loves us. He doesn't want to talk about differences. He wants to talk about the things that we have in common, but he wants to save us. He said, whoever believes in him will not perish. Even if our body perishes, our spirit will not. I don't know, David, but I heard you praying for someone that departed. Is that right? You know, um, we had some precious neighbor. Clarice uh, Lou is a, my wonderful, sweet landlady. I bring her everywhere I go for good luck. <laughs> She's a prayer. She's, she lives downstairs, and I got the upstairs. But she is a godly woman. Her, her daughters and, and grandkids are my dear friends. I played worship with them for years and did things with them, did retreats together with them. But her neighbor to the back was a sweet, godly lady. And she had, oh my word, she has a green thumb. All her fruit trees grow fruits. And we just pray that her limbs will extend over into our backyard so we can go shake those things. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but she is so sweet. She always shared with us. Everybody loves her. Great baker. She recently passed. And if it wasn't that we know where she is, this precious Wanda who always baked for churches and for everybody that would let her, it would be so hard to go on. But we know that... She gave her life to Jesus, and whoever believes in Him, the Bible says, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And we can just imagine Wanda looking down, you know, and, and, and saying, God, God bless them, help them, especially help those people that try to bake like me because they can't. Now, Clarice could, but a lot of folks can't. By the way, Clarice has blessed my life so much, but i got to tell you, there's sometimes that you don't know if it's a blessing or a bane because she cooks so good. That's why I look like this. <laughs> no, I'm not putting the rap on you. I'm just kidding. That's what lazy people do who don't want to work out on their Stairmaster. You know, they blame somebody else. But joking aside. So I, I want to tell you, seriously, as serious as I can possibly tell you, 
that there's going to be many, many times in our lives when we're going to need to have this verse down because it's a whole principle behind it. It's a whole, not philosophy, but theology to know our God and to know that whatever happens in our life, good days, bad days, sick or, or healthy, you know, rich or poor, disappointed or incredibly stoked, all things are working together in a pattern for good for our lives, for those that love God. See, the world really is a moral school, and God is teaching us here. It's like a test, and it's like a trust, and it's like a temporary assignment. God's put us here. This is not the end of it. This certainly isn't. You, you know, you talk to some of us oldsters, and we'll tell you how fast it passes. Don't you get tired of grandparents saying, well, honey, it goes really quickly, you know, and you got to grab for all the gusto you can. No, they don't say that, I hope. But, but you know, we're always telling you it goes fast. How many can identify with that? It goes quickly. Remember when you're having your 12-year-old birthday? Remember when you turned 21? Do you, I mean, do you remember this morning's breakfast? No? How many of you have a pulse right now? Raise your hand. Yes. Can you check the person next to you that looks catatonic? See? <laughs> no. I mean, our memories, our memories can fade. But I'm telling you something. In this world, God has put us here temporarily to do something for Him, to live for Him. That's what it's all about. Not just to exist not just to somehow get by and cope and hang in. So this is something that's going to change our life. I want us to get it this deep down in our heart that basically all things happen to all of us. Basically, not exactly the same. There is something that happens to one person, doesn't happen to the next person. But in general, we all go through the things. Think about the universals of life. You know, we're we're all born. We all eat food, drink water. You know, there's so many things that we all do. We all sleep. We all work. We all exercise. Well, some of us do. Uh, you know, we, we all have blood flowing through us. And someday, if the Lord delays His coming, we're all going to die with our flesh. That's what, that's what we just know to be true. But I want you to think about that. All those things that happen, once again, some people, it's going to make them a bomb. It's going to make them a failure. Others, it'll make them tremendously successful. Why? Because they're going to turn it over to God and say, Lord, I claim that promise that all things are working together for you. Because, Lord, I know I love you. I want you to think about Joseph for a minute. Do you remember Joseph? Here's this guy. He was a favorite of his family. His father loved him so much. You know, parents try not to have favorites. But sometimes there's certain ones that just are just a little bit sweeter to them because they're respectful and kind and good. Well, Joseph's dad loved him. Remember what he gave him? What? Ian, you want to say it? Say it. Good. Yes, exactly. That's right. And, and by the way, to us, that sounds good, but it really was special back then. You know, a lot of times it's a lot harder to get beautiful fabrics and embroideries and things. And he gave him that robe of many colors that Ian said. Exactly. And so guess what, though? He didn't give it to the other brothers. He gave it to Joseph. So what are the other brothers doing? Going, well, praise God. Bless my sweet brother. I am so glad. No, that's not what they did. They went, that rad. Look at that upstart. He thinks he's all that. So then, of course, dad takes it to the next level. So Joseph, he, he sees these guys, brothers glaring at him, glowering. Every time the dad hugs him, gives him a high five, they're over there looking at him like, you know. And so what do they do? Remember the story? They, they finally take him out and they sell him into slavery. They phony up some clothing with blood, make it look like that, that it, Joseph got killed. You know the story, right? And then Joseph gets hauled off by these slave traders and others off into Egypt. Egypt was not friendly to the Israelis, just as you see today. Those folks are at odds. And there's always been a bone of contention in the Middle East. As far back as we can see, there's been hatred and war since uh, Hagar. I mean, there's a a history behind it, and just keep, keep studying it. And I heard the people praying this morning, the prayer meeting, with wisdom, by the way, and sweetness in their heart. They weren't taking sides as much as they were saying, Lord, stop the hate on all sides. Stop the killing on all sides. Please let your peace enter into this. And God bless you guys, you prayer warriors, for that. And I know he hears our prayers. But Joseph is sold into Egypt. So let's see if I can make this happen. There we go. There is, that's the best thing I could come up with. He's an involuntary Egypt. Walk like an Egyptian, right? <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard. There was a song years ago called Walk Like an Egyptian. But it's supposed to be like those guys in the lower part. They used to have these certain kind of dances and stuff. But forget that. I just want to talk about the real true story of Joseph. Joseph is there, and so what happens? He's, he's in over there, but this guy, Potiphar, he meets him, and he looks him over, and he says, you know, I could use an extra hand, so he hires him on. 
Joseph goes in there, being a true-hearted man like he always was, he goes in there and rolls up his sleeve and goes to work for Potiphar. And he was honest, he had integrity, he was doing everything he's supposed to do. But he got to the point he really pleased God. And when you really, really, really please God, you know what happens. God just blesses your socks off, right? He rewards you. Uh -uh Uh-uh-uh, be careful. Not always directly, immediately. Usually, when you really, really, really lay down your life and decide you're not turning back, no turning back, no turning back, the enemy will come along and try to hassle you. He'll try to hurt you and stop you. Sure enough, here's one day, Joseph serving, and all of a sudden, Potiphar's away, and here comes Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife comes in there and tries to seduce Joseph. But I reiterate, he was a true-hearted man. The test is going to come to all of us sometime in life. We never know how it will come. But it came to Joseph that way. He's a regular red-blooded, young, strapping man. And here comes this, this person who doesn't have control of herself. And she's seducing him. And Joseph said, no. Booyah, booyah, right? <laughs> he said, I'm not doing it. Get it away. I don't want it. And so what happened? I don't actually know if he used uh, Goyu at the time, but he might have done. I don't know. <laughs> no, but anyway, Joseph said, get away from me. I'm not going to do it. And you know what? She turned and ran. No, she, she pressed forward. She pressed into the seduction. So what happened? She grabs Joseph, tries to embrace him. And the Bible says Joseph fled. He left his garment behind and fled. Can you imagine? I guess he's semi-streaking out the door. She's holding his clothes. And Shakespeare, I believe, was the one that wrote, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And the woman was furious. She's furious. She doesn't even know if Joseph is going to go blabbing to her husband or what's going to happen. But she knows one thing. She didn't get her way with him. And so what do you think happened? She starts accusing people, uh, Joseph to people, and even including Potiphar, and says, here's what he did. Here's what he tried to do to me. Are you going to let this person work here? Potiphar, he had a kind of mixed feelings about this. You know, he had something inside of him probably, I think, that, that wasn't so sure about his wife. Most people get a vibe if somebody's up to no good, don't they? Especially husbands and wives who are so bonded together. And he kind of, I believe, Potiphar kind of thought, ah, that's bad. We got to explore this out. But nevertheless, they had him thrown in jail. Joseph was a faithful, loving son, the favorite of his father. Uh, he got transported over to this place, kidnapped, basically, and pressed into service. And then... He gets accused as he's working as hard as he can, as honestly as he ever did as for his own, own brothers and sisters. And then this happens. And so there's Joseph. He's in prison. Now, can you imagine for a moment, remember in our verse, here's Joseph in prison. Can you imagine if some rabbi or somebody came to the prison and said, Joseph, don't worry about it. All things work together for good to them that love God. <laughs> Joseph would probably say, well, that may be, that may be, but, but I can't see it now. Well, Joseph, don't worry about this. All things work together for good to them that love God. He'd say, that probably, probably is true, but I sure don't see it right now. Everything in my life has gone south. Everything in my life has gone to sludge. And, and, and I just don't see that. But it was. It was. You know, you saw what happened to the story of Joseph. Do you remember? He became, after a point, when they saw who he really was, Joseph was put in that situation so they could see who he really was and and the gifts he had from God. And he wound up being the prime minister of Egypt in a time that great famine was coming. And I have to advance the story because we don't have time. So let me just nutshell it by saying Joseph became the person that helped to save not only the people of Egypt, but the whole people of the region and his own people, Israel. One of the reasons that that the children of Israel were able to grow and expand and survive and thrive was because Joseph was kidnapped and lied about and defrauded and his father's heart broken and horrible tragedies, ugly thing after ugly thing, parade of horribles. And yet God was working all things together for good. And I just want to parenthetically say maybe to you and me today, because the Bible is for us. It's not just history. It's not just back then. Maybe you're going through a struggle like that. Maybe you've gone through some disappointments or some injustice. Maybe you feel, in fact, like you're in prison. And then here's Pastor Ewan. I'm standing there going, don't worry. All things work together for good to them that love God. You might be saying, well, Pastor, that may be true, but I don't see it right now. I don't feel it. Right now, it doesn't feel like things are being working together for good. I don't see how it could be working together for any worse. But it is. 
You have to trust God and know His Word is true. It never fails. The grass withers and the flower fades, yes, but the Word of God endures forever. And that's what we can count on. We can build our life on the rock of Jesus Christ and His Word, the living Word, John said. He, he is the Word um, that endures forever. So you can trust Him. I want you to know right now, whatever bars that are holding you prisoner, whatever temptations are coming in your life, whatever lies or struggles that you're going through, whatever the devil grabs your ear and whispers into your life, don't receive it. You turn instead and, and shoo him away with the Word of God. Get down on your knees and pray. There's a cute little girl that, that, that would come up with these cute little things. She came up with one and she said, the devil trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. On her knees. I like that. The devil trembles because he hates to see us praying. He hates to see us using the Word of God, which is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Use the Word together. You know, um, Paul is the guy that wrote this passage. Remember him? Remember what he went through? He was beaten. He was stoned. He was lied about. He was thrown in prison repeatedly. You know, he was taken to that aisle and he had a snake bite him and poisonous. And I mean, he went through so much persecution. In fact, he's writing this letter to the Romans where one day he would even die. And here's what he's writing. Brothers and sisters in this new church that's planted there in Rome, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. What a beautiful, beautiful truth. See, the Bible says in Hebrews, no chastening for the present, you know, no discipline, no struggles for the present seem to be <laughs> joyous, but rather they're grievous. But I like this. It says, nevertheless, afterward, the chastening, it yields up the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto which they are exercised thereby. That's kind of King Jimmy phrase for saying, afterwards, it, it works something wonderful in your life. You just don't freak out over that. See, there's an afterward in life. When the bad times come, remember that thing that, thing that they like to say, this too shall pass, right? <laughs> I think my daughter has it tattooed on her arm to my consternation. <laughs> but I do agree that nothing like that comes to stay. It doesn't come to stay. You know, in King James, there's a phrase, and it says, and it came to pass. You remember that in the Christmas story? And it came to pass. They found Mary and Joseph in the bay. So I love that phrase, and it came to pass. Well, this, this old country preacher in Texas, he said, he was up there preaching, and he wasn't very learned, but he had a great heart. And he said, my favorite verse passage in the Bible is where it says, and it came to pass. And everybody's going, why? And he goes, I just praise God it didn't come to stay. <laughs> I kind of like that. Whatever hits you, know that it came to pass. This is not going to stay. It's, it's a temporary thing we got to go through. In this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Not you might have some struggles. He said, you will have tribulation. And if he said, if it was a period or an exclamation point there, I'm not so happy with this. But you know what? It doesn't say that. It has a comment. It says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. In His Word, that's what He says to us and His disciples captured it. I have overcome the world. There's an afterward in life. You know, I want you to notice there's something else in this text, and that's that little phrase that says, all things. Now, if the Bible said some things work together for good, we could buy that more easily. It wouldn't be the hardest verse in the Bible to believe because I know some things work together for my good, but all things? My, what a dimension that adds. That's pretty amazing. All things work together for good to them that love God. See, there's a providence working in such a way, our God, in our life, that whatever happens, the, the good things, the bad things that seems to us to be defined that way, He's working them into something beautiful because we're the ones that love God. It's our ultimate good, our ultimate good, which means conformed to the image of Jesus where He can take us to heaven and we're able to be there because we're redeemed. And we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, as the Bible says. Which means just that we've, we've accepted His death, burial, and resurrection. And we've believed in Him in our heart. And made Him our Lord and Savior. Let's put it this way. The only one that can take the minuses in life and make a plus out of them is God. That's really what the verse is saying. And think about that. The minuses in life. See, Jesus specializes in making resurrections come out of crucifixions. Think about the minuses. Think about a, somebody laying there dead. But the pluses, think about the cross. Jesus made a way where God can reach man in his heart. And the minuses in your life, in my life, God can make them into pluses where we're closer to him, where we're more conformed to him, his image. And I just love it that it says all things. 
Well, I want to, I want to remind you of this simple phrase. I want to do like Paul and focus on the little bits, all things. What does all things mean? You know, we preachers like to say this, and I know you've heard this before. We go, well, I looked up in the theological dictionary the word all, and it meant all. <laughs> that's right. Not, not, that's the way Texans say oil, all. But <laughs> I'm talking about A-L-L, all. <laughs> so all things, that's kind of powerful. But if you think about it, all things work together for good to them that love God. Here's an example I often think of. When I was a kid, my mom was a great baker. Maybe not as good as, as uh, our sweet neighbor Wanda. Maybe not as good as... Clarice, but she was a good baker. And I remember bopping into the kitchen one time. She's got all these things. In the old days, when I was growing up in the 1840s, <laughs> or whenever it was, they, there's all this stuff on the counter. There's beautiful, beautiful things there. And my mom, I said, what are you making? She goes, oh, I'm making y'all's favorite, a German chocolate cake. I'm going, oh, I love that. You know, German chocolate cake has a little coconut and chocolate and all these other delicious things in there. So boy, but I'm looking at it. It didn't look much like a German chocolate cake. So I look over there, and at least there's something I recognize, chocolate. So, boy, I know chocolate. And I, you know, I'm one of those type guys that if I was a robber, you know, I'd, I'd probably go, give me the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. You know I mean? I just, I love chocolate, right? So I go over there, and I get a handful of chocolate. They're little kind of drops, kind of weird thing. And I just pop it in my mouth so happy. <clears throat> Guess what? Have you ever had baking chocolate? I, I caution you, do not do that. <laughs> Call poison control immediately. <laughs> Baking chocolate is bitter, and it starts out pretty lame. You don't want it. So I thought, what in the world kind of trick is this? But at least before I got out of there, I looked over, and there's something else I knew as a little boy. Powdered sugar. You ever had that? Oh, my gosh, it's good. And I saw it. There's no mistaking that. It's white, crystalline looking. So I grabbed a big handful of powdered sugar, and I popped it in. What do you think it was? It was baking soda. Yes, you're right. Our prophetess said that. You're good over there. It was baking soda. I'm spitting. My mom's going, what are, you, what are you up to? Mom, what is this? Then I saw something else and I thought, oh, maybe that's better. I tried it and it was flour. Oh, no. Tasteless, right? So I'm going, wait a minute. How is this our favorite cake? How's this? Different? So I'm looking at all these ingredients in there. I'm going, my gosh, you know, after that flour, I just kind of hightailed it out of the kitchen. Said, heck with this. Tonight, I'm going to ask for ice cream instead of cake, I think, after, after the dinner. But you know what? It's a strange thing. My mom is in there with all these ingredients. All things on that cabinet were going together. And guess what she did? Think about the process. What do you think she did? She took a little bit here and a little bit there. And she mixed them in a great big mixing bowl. And then... What did she do? Well, she put them in the fire. And when she put them in the fire, out came in that oven, out came a beautiful German chocolate cake. All she had to do was ice it up and it's ready to go. Now, isn't that strange? Isn't that what God does to us? I thought about that a long time. It seems like in my life, I've run into that over and over where there's something I see that I think, oh, that could be good. I love that. And I go and indulge in it. And it's not what I thought. It turns out bitter. Everything the devil dangles, by the way, is that way. He doesn't want to bless you. He doesn't want to give you real pleasure. What he wants to do is give you a lure, like when we go fishing, that looks so good and shiny and wonderful, but it's got a hook. You know this. And, and that's, that's the thing. I, in my life, I've gone for that, and I've thought about that. So many times, I'll see something that looks very delicious, and it turns out to be horrible. I've got to spit it out. Sometimes there's something like that flower that's just boring. Have you ever had had an experience that's just pure boring, somebody on the back row goes, this sermon, oh, uh, <laughs> you do have to pay tithe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of our life, it just doesn't go what, what we think is going to go. It's not what we expect. But what I love to see is this. Our God takes those disappointing experiences, takes those bitter experiences. He takes that tasteless experiences in our life. And what does he do? He mixes them all together. It says all things work. How? together for them that love God. And then, what does He do to you and me? Well, He puts us in the fire. That's what He does. So next time you're in the fire, remember that. There's a beautiful song by Elevation or somebody, or no, it's Hillsong, and it says, another one in the fire. When they were in there, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, what did they see? There's a fourth one. Who was that? The Bible says there's a fourth one in there with us, like unto the Son of God. 
There's another one in the fire. You may go in through the thickest part of fire in your life. Who knows? Maybe your loved one, your grandma, your father or mother, maybe your sister or brother. But I want you to understand this. God is going to work it all together for good to those that love Him. Now, I don't know about you, but I sort of feel like that whatever happens in, in life, if it draws us closer to God, it's a good thing. By the way, there's a German chocolate cake. That's one. The, the better ones, like my mom made, have that icing all down there, but they're pretty good. Quit, quit salivating. Let's move on. Have you ever been, like I've been, where sometimes I, I'm like a boat in the ocean going along, a beautiful sailboat. Everything's going cool. I'm on a great, great voyage. All of a sudden, I get my boat out there where it shouldn't be. I just sail right on into something that I know better than to do. You know, I don't pay attention to all the warnings that I've got from God, and, and I'll sail right on into it. And, and I realize, man, this is wrong. This is horrible. Well, I feel like anything that draws us back to God and closer to God is worth it. It's a good thing. You know, there's a little boy who got a boat for his birthday, and he took it to this big pond near his house, and he put this little boat in the water. He was having so much fun. But you can already guess what happened. What do you think happened? He's putting the boat out there, and it's going out there a little ways, and he's getting it. He's putting the boat down there, and it's going out a little ways, and then he gets it. Well, guess what happened at one point? Somebody yelled or something. He looked over. Some guys were on a bike, and he looked back, and there's boat got away from him. And he couldn't go. It was a kind of a steep drop-off. Everybody knew about this pond, the way they dug it out. You can't go out there, gentle slope. You, you drop off. And he already knew that. So he goes, my boat. And he starts yelling, my boat. And this, this older boy comes along, junior high school kid. Here's this little elementary school kid. And he says, my boat. Help me get my boat. And the guy goes, what's the matter with you? And he goes, my boat's out there. It got away from me. And the guy said, hmm. So this, this bigger boy, he grabs a rock and he throws it at the boat. This little kid says, I said, help me get my boat. I didn't say tear it up. And he gets another rock, ignores the kid. He throws it at the boat. What do you think he's doing? If you don't know, you ask her. Because she already knows. <laughs> I'm kidding. She already knows. That's my, my prophetess, so I'm just kidding you. But he throws another rock. And by that time, this little boy started figuring it out. He started doing two, putting two and two together. He is looking at those rocks. And that big boy, he threw every single one of those rocks, not at the boat, but just past the boat. You know what it did? It created these little ripples. And gradually, it started moving the boat back to shore. And pretty soon, they could just reach in there and pull it out. You know, that's happened to me in my life when I've gotten out there where I shouldn't be. And all of a sudden, I cry out to God and I pray. And it seems like things just get intensify. It goes from just a, a little mild storm to a hurricane or to a tornado, it seems like, in my life. A squall in the ocean, a perfect storm. But you know what? I cry out to God and it, it sobers me up from all the foolishness. It gets me sick of all the, the worldly things and the materialism and, and the things that the devil tells me are going to be so satisfying and so good and lies to me about it, and it starts pushing me back to God. The next thing you know, I'm pressing into the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm down on my knees, and I'm saying, God, forgive me. Lord, I've come home. And I hear the Lord saying, welcome back, son. Welcome back. Let's kill the fatted calf. Welcome back to the things that you once believed in. Welcome back to what you knew was right from the start. All you got to do is be what you always wanted to be. Welcome back to the love that is in your heart. That's what happens when He draws us back to Him, to His foreordained purpose for us. You know, the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. Together. So I want you to think about this. George Washington, who was our general during the Revolutionary War, he fought nine battles. Nine. You know what? He lost six. He lost six, but he won the war. Isn't that strange? He, he lost and lost and lost. So when you go through a defeat, remember it's the battle, but it is not the war. There, there's the, a passage in here that says this, this, this beautiful promise, and then right in the middle of it says, all things work together for good. It took all of those battles. You're going to lose a few of those battles. Don't worry about that. I will too. But we're going to win the war because God has given us a promise. Well, I've belabored that point enough. I want to ask you, do you live by this? Do you believe this verse? Are you willing to say, Lord, no matter what, come what may, struggles, peace, easiness, hard, hardship, war, hatred in our culture, in our, in our world, I'm going to press into you and say all things are working together in my life <clears throat> because I'm one of the ones that love you and I'm one of the ones that know that I'm called according to your purpose. If I'm well tomorrow, if I'm sick tomorrow, I'm still going to praise you. George Matheson was a wonderful Christian man. He loved the Lord so much and he met his dream. He had prayed for a beautiful, godly woman. By the way, you, you young people that are not yet married, 
I hope you're praying that God will be the one to put you with the right wife. It says in Proverbs, your fathers can give you houses and lands, but only the Lord can give you the right wife for the right husband. So cry out to God. And George Matheson, he finally got a woman that he knew was right, and he got engaged to her. He was so happy, but he goes to his doctor, and the doctor says, wow, you've got a problem with your eyes, and you're going to lose your eyesight. George Matheson knew as a man of integrity, he had to go tell his fiancée. He said, honey, in a short while, a few months at the most, I'm going to be blind. But he knew what she was going to say because she loved him. He knew she was going to say, well, George, that doesn't matter at all. I love you, not your eyes. I, I love all of you, and it doesn't matter. That is not what she said. She took off her engagement ring. She gave it back to him, true story, and said, well, George, you couldn't expect me to be married to a blind man. And she walked away. Oh, he was devastated. He was wrecked. He loved her with his heart. That was, he thought, his soulmate. He was going to spend the rest of his life with, and now he, he's alone. He was so broken, so disappointed. He was crushed. So he goes back home. But you know what he did? It was some of those ripples that were pushing him back to God. And he got home and he said, Lord, the best I can do, I'm drawing my sorry carcass to the foot of the cross. And I'm saying, please, come and help me. Sometimes the best, most theological prayer you can pray and I can pray is, help. <laughs> Cry out to him. When my little kids said, help, daddy, I came running. You better know that. You could have 500 kids screaming. But if my little kids said, daddy, help, I can hear my kid. And I ran in there. And that's, that's how the Lord is. And so he got on his knees and prayed. And the Lord heard George Matheson. And you know what? Out of that struggle, he became a great Christian hymn writer a great Christian minister. He wrote a hymn. Some of you may know it. We don't know hymns like we used to. Occasionally, some of our contemporary Christian artists will do a, a hymn, like a remix or a, a different version of it. But this was one called, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. And it, it kind of goes like this. Here's what George Matheson wrote in his crushed experience after he turned back to God. He goes, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, I rest my weary soul in Thee and give thee back the life I owe. In other words, I give you back the life that I owe. Ah, that in its ocean depths and flow may richer, fuller be. In other words, my life will be richer because of what I went through and what I give back to you. That's the way it works. There was a man uh, named William Cooper. It looks like Cowper, you know, and he wrote something I used to think was in the Bible, like, like, like I was telling you about people don't know if it's poor Richards or not. In fact, I asked my English honors advisor, who wrote that? God moves in mysterious ways. Have you ever heard that phrase? You, know, you thought it was Ben Franklin, right? God moves in mysterious ways. Well, that comes from a beautiful poem called Light Shining Out of Darkness. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. And, and it's a beautiful thing. just want you to know that, that that's the cross that we, we look at. This, this thing was a, it, born out of an interesting thing, like we're talking about. William Cooper came to such a depressed part of his life he did something we must never do because it's God's providence only, but he was going to kill himself. He decided he was going to snuff it. He was, going to, he was going to end it. So he got in a cab, one of those handsome cabs in England, and he says, take me down to the Thames. I'm going to, he didn't tell him. He says, I got to, something I got to do there. And the cabbie looked at him, felt a little uneasy. But the cabbie was new and he got lost. Couldn't even find the Thames in England. And so Cowper was so disgusted, he said to him, ah, oh, then just take me home. So the guy took him home. He couldn't drown himself. Well, he goes in his house, and there's a big beam across there, a big main beam. And he grabs this rope in the corner, and he throws it over that beam. And he, he makes him a noose, and he, he ties it up there, and he puts it around his neck. He gets up on a stool, and he kicks the stool out. It catches, and then the rope broke. Now, I don't advise you trying this, okay? Because <laughs> your rope might not break. They make better ropes today than they... But anyway, the rope broke. True story. And so William Cooper, it looks like Cowper, but William Cooper is sitting there on the floor, and then he crawls over there, sits down, and then he realizes, God must have something better for me than this. You know, epiphany. His eyes were opened up. The eyes of his spirit, like Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened. And the eyes of his spirit were opened. And so here's what he did. He sat there, and after a, a, a time of growing close to God and getting back to him, rededicating his life, he wrote this beautiful poem. Here's where that came from. It said, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footprints on the sea. He walks upon the storm. Deep and unfathomable mind of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright design. He works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, 
Fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread. For big with mercy, they will break like blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense. Trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan His works in vain. God is His own interpreter, and He will make it plain. Can you say that? Even when the clouds seem dreadful and it seems like providence is frowning, behind that there's a loving God whose smile is more filled with love than your mom smiled at you when you were at your mother's breast, than your dad smiled at you when he was first looking upon you and, and beaming at the birth of his new baby. He loves us with an everlasting love. And that's what William Cooper came to realize. And yes, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform, but he makes something beautiful out of it. And he's his own interpreter. And he will make it plain what's going to happen. Trust in brothers and sisters. That's all I'm saying. Well, I want to know if you can say that. Let's go back to Adler's story right quick as we close. Here's this guy. All these bad things happened to him. He became an alcoholic. Is that going to be you? Is that going to be me? And here's a guy. All these same bad things happened. The very same. Because he's part of the same family. And he became a tremendous success. The same sun shined on the clay. Became brittle and broken. But it also shined down on the wax and became soft and pliable, something God could use. That's what I want us to be. Let's bow our heads for a second before we close completely out today. Lord, I thank you that you love us with an everlasting love and you do speak to our hearts through your word. Lord, help us to get into the word and know what you say and, and take every phrase seriously, every little word seriously, because we see that your servants did. When you breathed your inspiration into these words that got it into your book, Lord, we see that it was, it was written with due consideration. And Lord, I thank you that you're the one that loves us so much that you gave us a light to walk by. No wonder the psalmist said, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path always. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd help us to walk by faith, but that we can always say, no matter what, all things work together for good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose. So let your purpose be fulfilled in our life. Now, before I completely end, I wanted to just give you a chance to, to do this. If you're not yet a believer, you can just right now say, Lord, I want to become a Christian. I've come and I've, I'm not trying to be a poser, but I've tried my best to fit in, but I've never really made that connection. It's like somebody that, that has a girlfriend or a fiance or a boyfriend, and I've never really gotten married, so to speak. I've never really said, I give you my life. So I want to say to you this morning, if you've never said to him, Lord, I want to become a Christian. I want it to be sure that I am. Your word says, whoever will may come. Your word says, whoever believes in you will not perish. And the Bible also says, your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. That's indelible. It can never be struck from there. You really give your heart to him. You will be saved. The Bible says that nobody can snatch you out of his hand if you give your heart to him. So if you've never done it and you want to become a, a Christian for sure today, then just whisper that to Him. I'll, I'll pray a little prayer. You pray along with me if you've never done this. And this can be your spiritual birthday. Let's pray together. If that's you, I want you to pray this especially. Dear Lord, and just say it in your heart, Dear Lord, that's right, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I know I can't be perfect in any way. But I've heard that you love me. and Your word does resonate in my life. And I want to give my life to you. I don't understand it all. And I know you'll help me to understand it more when I get your Holy Spirit in me. But today, on this 15th of October, 2023, I want to say to you, I become a Christian. I join the family of God. I become a member of this forever family in this branch over here at EFCOC. And Lord, this will be my family that I'll walk among and I'll help and bless and love them. But more than anything else, I know you'll write my name in your book of life in heaven. And when I get there, there's a reservation for me. I don't have to spell any words, but it's already been done. You've saved me. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, I was in a service about like this when I did it. If that's you, I want you to just pray it to Him and just mean it in your heart and He will save you. One other thing, there was a time in my life where I had backslidden. I told you about that. I was out playing music and doing what I wanted to do. Sometimes if you go down that path a little ways, you'll get into a sensuality and you'll get into fleshliness and, and materialism and all kinds of pride and arrogance and things. 
<clears throat> Maybe it happened to you like it happened with me. I got a little further away from God than I should. And if you're, if you're farther from God than you used to be, who moved? Was it him or was it you? I'm not saying this to con- con- condemn you. I'm saying it that the Holy Spirit can convict you because that's what he does. But if you want to rededicate your life to Christ, that's what I did after a time. I came back and said, Lord, I've never quit being a Christian. I gave you my heart. I know my lame, name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but I want to rededicate my life to you today. And I'm coming back to my first love. I'm returning to you. If that's you, brothers and sisters, I'd like you to pray that and say, Lord, I rededicate my life today. I've already given you my life. I'm already a Christian, been baptized and confirmed and all the things, but I know I haven't been living for you. I haven't cracked the Bible open in months, maybe a year or two. I haven't prayed much. I know I'm far from you. Please forgive me and please restore my heart. I'm coming home. If that's you, you pray that right now. Pray something like this. He's not so much interested in the words as your heart, but pray. Lord, I've wandered away from you, but now I'm coming home. I've, I've walked a path that I know it's wrong, but I'm coming home, Lord. And please, Lord, receive me back and, and, and hug me again like the prodigal son hugged his, uh, father hugged his son in the prodigal son story where the father hugged him. Lord, let it be that you take me and bring me back and dust me off and set me back on my feet and help me to grow and become what you want me to be. Brothers and sisters, pray that prayer today and he will, he will take you back and, and strengthen you so strong that you'll begin to walk in the power and the purpose that he created you for. Thank you, Lord, once again for hearing us today and being with us. Thanks for this precious worship team who plays this beautiful music to you. And I like the way their hearts are humble, that they, they caused us to look to you. They deflected our heart and our attention right up to the heavenlies. Bless them for that, Lord. Help it to always be thus. God, and bless everybody that came here today, that they'll leave out of here richer and better than when they came because of your word and your love. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen. God bless you, EFCOC. Please stand up. Jesus, 
you're my holy stay. When I pass, when I fall on you, Jesus, you're my holy stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, Oh God, how I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Pastor Ewan once again for his message this morning. And that concludes our Sunday service. Uh, if you'll stick around, we have refreshments in the back, and then we'll, we'll be having uh, life groups afterwards. So thank you, and have a blessed Sunday morning.